This week on Sports Inclusive, I'm joined by Jim Maxwell, Scottish-born professional and amateur golfer, and John Allnack, former CIS football player and longtime Moncton High School football coach. It's a tremendous honor to actually sit down uh, with Jim Maxwell. Jim, you and I go way back. We've played some, some golf together, but let's discuss, because a lot of people don't, don't realize, where were you born? I was born seven miles from the first tee in St. Andrews, Scotland. So, and, and this, when we're shooting this just now, it's open, open week in, in uh, Britain. And it's played at a other course that I was a member at, Carnoustie. So it's like old home week for me this week. It's, and first of all, Greg, thanks for inviting me. Well, it's, like I said, Jim, it, it's an honor and a privilege to sit down and talk about your career because your career is an amazing span of longevity <laughs> and consistency. It really is. What, what's your earliest recollection of actually playing the game um, and how old were you? I actually started playing when I was seven years old. The first tournament I was in was a, a tournament, that there was three divisions, eight to 10, 11 to tw 12, 13, 14. And I won the eight-year-old division. And I brought my clubs along with me. And when I won that tournament, I played with three clubs. Now, because I'm getting old, now I play with four clubs. And that's all you people need to play golf. <laughs> Four clubs. Four clubs. And I, I was lucky last year. I played with these four clubs, and I shot 74 at country medals, two over par. So. Wow. So you don't need 14 clubs. <laughs> the, the journey, Jim. You know, how do you go from playing amazing golf as, as a youngster and growing up on a Lynx-style golf course playing that game, and you find yourself in, in North America, was it a culture shock for you? Uh, no, not in a way. I, early on, I wanted to be a soccer player, a professional soccer player. When I turned 12, then I thought, no, I want to be a professional golfer. So back in those days, that would be the early 50s, in order to be a professional golfer in Britain, you had to start off as a club maker or an apprentice club maker. So that's how I started. And um, so you made clubs, made or put grips on and put heads on, married shafts to heads and stuff like hickory. that. Hickory, hickory. No, this is steel shaft days now. Wow. Yeah, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> but did you play with hickory growing up? Yeah, I played with hickory. <laughs> I'd like to see these guys nowadays play with, with the hickory and the balls we played with back then. Yeah. They wouldn't hit the ball 400 yards like they do today. Which yeah. Again, that's, so, to me, it's ridiculous. When, how old were you when you became an apprentice? 16, I quit school. Quit school? Yeah. My, now, was that commonplace? If, if you wanted to be a, a pro at anything, did you, like, during those days in, in, in the game of golf, did you have to say, okay, I'm dedicating my full day to this? No, I think if, if you were going to be a club pro, and that's what I thought I was going to be to start with, and that's what I finished up with anyway, uh, you'd have to learn how to make the clubs and fix clubs that were broken and stuff like that. Right. So that's how you start. Uh, I'd done that for one year, and uh, I still played amateur tournaments all the time because I'm not a professional junior and, and senior. And uh, there was a golf pro in Toronto his name was Willie Lamb. He was from Montrose, which was about 30 miles from where I was. And he would get the Sunday paper, and he'd see my name in the Sunday paper all the time. And he wrote and asked if I would like to come to Canada as an assistant golf pro at the Lampton Golf and Country Club in Toronto. So that's how I finished up in Canada. Wow. I had in two minds, I, it was between Canada or Australia. When I left home, this is back in the days before jets, it takes a while to get across <laughs> the, the Atlantic Ocean. I fly out of Presswick at midnight, and I come down into Canada, and it's uh, the morning of the April the 17th, 1957, 
and I look out the window of the plane, and the snow is higher than the plane. And I said, I should have gone to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> but what I didn't realize, I landed in Goose Bay, Labrador. <laughs> well, there to you me, go. that was Canada. There yeah. you go. <laughs> so, so. Tremendous career, Jim. Y you come east, and you, you s you've won at every level. Like, folks, I don't know if you realize this. He was the youngest uh, player on, on your high school team. Yeah. You, like, <laughs> it's just phenomenal, Jim, uh -huh. what the game of golf has given you. It but has. it's it's hard yeah. work, though. And, well, and maybe just discuss the hard work and the, the time that you put into the game. It's dedication to the game is what it is. It's, it's not hard work if you enjoy what you're doing, right? Um, I've also been very lucky. Uh, the club I worked at in Toronto, one of the members, her a lady's name, she was Marilyn Stewart Street, and she wow. was at one point in the, I think in the 50s, she was the lady champion of the universe. She was British ladies champion, New Zealand ladies champion, Australian ladies champion, U.S. ladies champion, Canadian ladies champion. And I had the privilege of playing with her quite a bit. The other thing, most of golfers have heard of Mo Norman. I was lucky again. Uh, I played quite a bit of golf with Mo Norman. And he, as far as I'm concerned, was the best golfer in the world. And you know, it was amazing what he could do with a golf ball. So I've been very lucky. How special is it? You know, in that era, and being a golf pro in this, in the Maritimes, Jim, and how close knit all those golf pros were. Of obviously, it was competitive, but the all good, it was, it close friends. Yeah, we were all buddies. How special was that? Uh, real special. Yeah, yeah. I got a lot of fond memories of that. And then, usually in the f in the fall uh, Labor Day area, half a dozen of the pros from the New England states would come up here and play in. Uh, the Island Open, the Amherst Open, the Moncton Open, and we got to know some of them too. I also had the pleasure of playing against Bill Izanicki, the hockey player. The hockey player. In my first Moncton Open, I think it wow. was. And I was tied with him going into the second round. And all I can remember is he chipped in on the 11th hole or something in the second round, and after that I never saw him. <laughs> <laughs> so. A tremendous pro career, teaching and, and playing competitively. You stepped away from the game, but when you came back, how special was the Wellington Cup, you know, make, making that team, Jim? Oh, that, I had tears that day. Yeah. I quit as a pro in 68 because by this time I had a wife and three kids, and they had a, an unusual habit. They wanted a roof over their head and three meals a day, and being a golf pro <laughs> down here then, I just couldn't make enough money to yeah. feed them. And back in those days, you had to sit out eight years to get an amateur card. So I kind of lost interest in golf. Uh, eight years. Yeah. Now, it it's, was, now it's two to three well, it was tops. Six, it, was six, it was an automatic two years and six, six months for each year you were a pro. So I had to sit out eight. So if I couldn't play competitive, I didn't really want to play. But then in the late 70s, early 80s, I got, 1980, I got the urge to play again. So I thought, yeah, okay, we'll start playing. So I did. My first tournament as an amateur, I think, was in St. Andrews in 1981. So, wow. And then since then, I made three, three Wellington Cup teams. That first one I made, I made it at Riverside in St. John. I can still remember tapping in that little putt to be on the, te on the team in the tears kind of came down. <laughs> and, the and I was on again the next year, and that was in Capilano in BC. And the last one was uh, Saskatoon, Riverside in Saskatoon. Wow. Then after I became an old man and turned 55. <laughs> actually, uh, just to backtrack a little, uh, I had I had chest pains in 1993 playing Country Meadows with Greg Doucette. Okay, we're going up 17, and I said, Greg, I can't go any further. It was early in July. So I walked in, and I went to the doctor the next day, I think it was. And uh, 
I said, I got some chest pains. And he said, well, you better get down to outpatient and see what's going on. And I said, no, I got to go to Frederick. I'm, I'm in the amateur. It starts on Wednesday or whatever yeah. day it was. No, you go down. So I listened to him. So when I get down there, yeah, they check out. You got heart problems. Wow. And I was a smoker in those days, pack a day, religiously. And somebody was telling me, the better shape you're in when you hit the OR table, the faster you recover. So my goal was to play in the 1994 Canadian Senior Championship. It wouldn't matter where it was I was going. I had one of my daughters was a flight attendant, and I could get a pretty cheap flight any place, and I'd bunk in with somebody wherever it was. So that was my goal to quit smoking. Comes out in, I have the operation in October of 93, so I'm fine by the middle of summer 94. No, at the start of 94, they come out with the dates for it. Yeah. And instead, my birthday is the same as Arnold Palmer and Brooke Henderson, by the way. <laughs> September the 10th. And it was always played in the middle of September. And uh, this year, they move it to the last week in August because they're playing in Winnipeg and they're scared of frost. Frost, so yeah. Didn't make it, which worked out better for me still because I get to go to the 95 one and I go as the NB champion and I played the finest golf course I played in Ca Canada, the Royal Callwood out in Victoria, BC. Wow. Beautiful golf course. And I marveled when I played Capilano at the size of the trees. And they, they said, well, you go to the island. They really got trees there. And it's true. There was one green there, Craig, that never saw sunlight. And it just amazed me that they had grass on the green like that. Part three, that uh -huh. never saw the sun, but they kept that immaculate somehow. Take you a minute to walk around these trees, one of them. Your career is still ongoing. It is. I, I still enjoy the game, except it's a lot tougher now, Craig, because my knuckles don't want to cooperate anymore. <laughs> I've got a hard time wrapping them around the club. The only thing I'm disappointed now, and it's a, it's a pet peeve with me, is this state the game of golf is in now. Yeah. If you look at the commercials on the Golf Channel, Every one of us should shoot 54 every time we go out with the equipment they make nowadays. Yeah. So you can buy a game, right? And the other really disappointing thing is pace of play. Yeah. Growing up in Scotland, four of us playing, carrying our clubs, or some of the older guys, the guys Pull in the cards. 30s, the old guys in the, the 30s. Old guys. They would have a trolley and pull them along with them. If we took longer than three hours to play 18 holes of golf, the game's not for you, laddie. You better go play something else. And it's not like that nowadays. I think one of the most ridiculous things I heard in the past two or three weeks, USG's solution to the too much time will play nine holes. Now, can you believe that? This, wow. this is the governing body of PGA or the USGA and the RNA. And I, I, in a way, I blame both those bodies for the state of the game now. They've let the manufacturers get away with it. And dictate. And dictate. Yeah. Most golf, is, golf courses now are obsolete because yeah. they're too short. They're hitting the ball 400 yards now. Yeah. Jim, it's, it's been a tremendous honor and privilege f for me not only to, to get to know you as a friend, but also to play, play golf with you. It, it's just you are golf. You know, I look at golf. Um, I had the pr privilege in, in, of playing at Country Meadows under the, the tutelage of yourself and Doug Sullivan and, and Kevin Dugas as a, as a kid. Um, just the pro ranks around here, how special were, were those years to you? And looking ahead, the game of golf, in, in your opinion, the state that it's in. Well, the years I've been actually, since I quit as a pro, I became a member, or I was invited as a member by Doug to Country Meadows in 81, and I've been a member of Country Meadows since then, basically. And uh, it's been my honor to have Sullivan as a friend. Yeah. He's, he's a special guy, and the way he takes care of the kids out there, too. Yeah. That's why there's so many good golfers that come out of Country Meadows. They start at a young age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you started at a, uh, at a very young age, Jim. Uh, again, continued success. 
uh, in everything that you do. And thanks so much for coming Thank in. Thank you very much for inviting me, Craig. Keep your head down. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had a, a basically a red shirt year at St. Mary's uh, coming out of high school uh, under the uh, under Larry Utech, who uh, was a fantastic coach in the AUS. And uh, that first year, I just got beat up every day and uh, had no idea what I was doing at the university level. And uh, really, it was a formative year. So when I went to Mount Allison after that, I transferred. Um, you know, I was fortunate to get on the field, and by my second year, I was starting. But I guess probably my third year, um, going after my second year, I had a, a sit down with Mark Laranger, who was the coach at the time and had taken the Mounties to the Vanier Cup in '91 as a rookie head coach. And uh, I remember going to his office and uh, had a recipe card and a pen, and I and I sat down. And I said, I don't want to play defensive back anymore. And I looked at the depth chart, <laughs> neither did he didn't want me to play neither. <laughs> he had moved me down a spot. So, so he's, he says, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to play linebacker. And if you can imagine a guy five foot nine and not, you know, five foot nine, 180 pounds saying he wants to play linebacker, you, you smile and you, you tell him what to do and you don't expect anything. And he said, you know, you got to get some linear speed. So. I don't even know if I had the A before the E or E before the A, <laughs> linear speed. And then after that, he said, you've got to uh, do the Olympic lifts. And uh, you've got to learn how to play the position. And you have to, uh, you have to do things where you're going to move, but you can't time them or measure them. And if you can imagine being told, throw a tennis ball in the air and then chase it, uh, well, you would have seen a, a kid on uh, Dufferin Street chasing a tennis ball and uh, you know, I guess the rest is history because I followed to a letter. Uh, the I followed that template to a T. Uh, hooked up with uh, Peter Stewart, the ASEA coach, who's actually coached my daughters, uh, Janelle, who's a sprinter, yeah. and uh, Jocelyn, who's a thrower. So back in '94, I hooked up with Peter Stewart at the old Moncton High track, and he ran us. He <laughs> ran me like a rented <laughs> mule. And um, Stephanie Reed out of Riverview was actually there. And she was a very good athlete and still yeah. is a good athlete. And uh, if you can imagine being 20 years old and having some 14-year-old girl flying by you, uh, that was uh, good medicine for me. Uh, I realized that you know I, I, my quest for speed was going to take a little bit of time. So as things turned out, came back in the fall, played linebacker, and had three good seasons um, as an individual. And we made the playoffs my last year. It was very proud of that. Uh, uh, as a team, we fought through a lot of adversity, got to make some really good friends. And, and you know, I played university football during the Quebec ref referendum, the 94 referendum, I believe is the date. And, you know, I learned a lot about Canada and Quebec that not in the classroom, but just in the locker room. Right. And, and I think that, you know, the sport taught me a lot about, uh, I guess, listening and tolerance because you can have an opinion, but somebody else may not share it, and that's got to be okay. So, you know, that was a, a big, a big learning thing. So, what legacy do you want to leave at Moncton High, okay, as a, as a teacher and as a football coach? Well, I, I think that uh, the early days of me coaching there, um, I had the '90s hangover where you know maybe the kids that were choosing to play football were a little rough around the edges or, 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 or had some different views on, on uh, be, what, would, what it meant to be a student athlete. And I think we've long since passed, cleaned up any misinformation on that. You know, I'll go to bat for kids uh, if they're hard working and they're making good decisions. But by and large, it's uh, character and ability. That, that's our mantra. And I think that the kids that we're looking at um, as they graduate, you know, going on to post-secondary opportunities and being good at life, you know, um, I think that's the biggest legacy. Uh, we'll enjoy the football memories, but, you know, these kids that are going to go on and be, you know, giving back to the community, I think that's a huge piece, and I think that, uh, you know, the players today are, are tomorrow's leaders at Moncton High. So. Well, you've given back to our community, not only at Moncton High, but in the, the entire football community here in Moncton for that. We thank you, John, and uh, continued success at Moncton High and in any endeavors uh, on the football field. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.